So now we go into something called Nyquist Theorem. And hopefully we'll get through this before lunch. Nyquist Theorem. Dr. Nyquist said that we're going to take two times the highest audio and sample it times that. So in our case, most of our radios start around the 300 to 3K. There's some that go to 3200 or 34. I've seen one as high as 36. Do you really need to be that high? Not for voice communication. You're not going to be singing in the middle of a battle. It just ain't going to happen. But there will be a lot of squeaky voices and a lot of deep vibrato voices. And what they tried to do is keep the sampling rate within a certain area. So what he said is, all right, just to be on the safe side, we're going to keep this at 4K, and we're going to sample it two times at 4K to give us 8,000 samples per second. Now, why does that have an important analogy for us? Well, we deal with something called PCM. You guys have done this in Block 2. You came across it. You had the handset that went into the radio, and it changed your analog voice into digital, didn't it? Oh, yeah, it did. And then, of course, it put it on an analog waveform to be sent out so your digital information is actually modulated on an analog waveform. You'll get to see this when we get into modems too, by the way. PCM, Pulse Coded Modulation. Before I go any further, has anybody ever heard of the free software audio program called Audacity? I've heard of it. Okay. I use it, sir. Good. I've heard of it. Yeah. Well, I use that when I'm trying to... I heard of it after. So. Uh, that's old school for us. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that, that's downloading <laughs> music. This one is the, the expanded version of PCM because it is PCM when you're saving it to the MP3. When you are sampling... And, and you could probably relate to this, Tex Sergeant Cannon, is when we first got CD players, they came with a sample rate which was 8,000 times a second. We thought we had it made. Woohoo! I love our audio gear. And then it went from 8K to 16K, and then to 32, then to 64, and we couldn't keep up. Nowadays, if you went to Audacity, they have three modes. The last mode's called insane at 320k of sampling. That is ridiculous. But with PCM, we're only dealing with voice. We're not dealing with music. So let's take a look at each one of these three steps to convert analog to digital using pulse-coded modulation. First step, sampling. What we're going to do is we're going to take the audio signal. We're going to divide it into 8,000 sections. Each one of them is going to be equal. And then we're going to use the pulse method. In other words, we're going to measure up to the pulse and figure out where that line is on the voltage. And what we're going to do with that line is by taking that sample, we're going to put it onto something called a quantization table. Now, most of you probably dealt with a paper or a graph paper of some sort, and you'll notice that each one of the boxes are equal in uh, width versus height. And what they've done here is we're going to put each one of those samples on a horizontal line and each one of those width boxes is how far apart they're going to be. Now we have something called a quantization table, and that's what that graph paper is going to represent. And that's just to give you guys an idea of what's going on. This table goes from a 0 to positive 127, and from a 0 to negative 127. 
Now, for most of you, you're going, okay, I don't get it. But I want you to go back to that 8-bit word. 8-bit word. When you go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and you add all of those, you come up with, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, you get 127. Hmm. Interesting. On the quantization, when we apply these little voltages to this table, we have 127 steps on the plus side and 127 steps on the negative side. We have two different types of table. One's a uniform, one's a non-uniform. The problem with uniform quantizing is when it falls between a line, we have to do something called rounding up or rounding down. These are considered quantization errors. On a uniform table, they are a problem because you're going to have a lot of rounding to do. These errors, if there is a lot of them, will sound a little bit like distortion. At least that's the way they classify it when you Google that. When you get into non-uniform quantizing, what they've done is they said, you know, most of our voices is between this level and this level. What we're going to do is we're going to cram as many lines as we can so we don't have as many quantization errors. So we still have 127 steps. The difference is, is as they're closer to zero, those steps are smaller, so where each one of these sampling items can fit on a line instead of having to round them over and create quantization errors. So with that in mind, you still have errors, especially if you got somebody who's got a really high voice or a really low voice, and you just can't get away from it. But by squashing those lines together, you can at least eliminate a lot of the quantization errors. The next part is called encoding. So you have sampling, quantizing, and now encoding. There are eight bits. Wait a minute, I, yeah, I just told you there were seven on the negative and the positive 127. Uh, mm, interesting. Oh look, the first seven bits gives us the 127, the eighth bit is going to identify whether it's on the positive side or the negative side. Oh look, we have an 8-bit word. Amazing now. So let's take a look at this chart here. And you can see that we've got some figures in here. And you see the first one we're going to come across is a positive 2. That's this little device right here. Notice that we're going from left to right. Bad on them. So when we draw an 8-bit word, which they got correct, they just didn't do the signal right, you go, here's your 1, here's your 2. So that is a plus 2. All your zeros are considered positive numbers. When you get, let's just say, a negative 5, well, there's a 1 in the 1 place. There's 2. There's 4. So 4 and 1 gives us 5, but this number right here identifies it as a negative 5. Now, I'm not sure if you can get into this figure here to do the executable file, but it is nice if you can see it. And it does a pretty good job of it in showing you how the digitation works. So any questions on PCM? Quantizing, you had uh, sampling, quantizing, and encoding. That's how it gets to the 8-bit code. So you're taking an analog signal, and by the time it all comes out, you have 
a digitized signal. That's how your PCM works in the PRIC 150. Do we need to know how to decipher the binary code from the quantization? No, you just need to know that you got eight bits. On the eighth bit, identifies whether it's above or below the uh, zero line. Copy that. So, Roundsley, you there yet? Yes, sir. I was told that I um, that you called on me earlier, but I was in the bathroom, so sorry about that. You know that you can text us, you know, just down in the chat, hey, I I've got to go to the bathroom, and I would have waited. Okay, sorry, sir. I'll do that next time. Yeah, and that goes for everybody else. If you've got to go, just, you know, hey, drop a little chat down in the chat line. You'll be good. We just, you know, because I was asking you a question, and it didn't make you look good, that's for sure. So, yes, sir. now that you're back, what corrects for quantization errors? The, um, whenever it would automatically, like, I don't know the exact word, but say, like, if you have something between a line then it will, um, is it quantize? Is that what it is? Uniform quantizing. Okay. Non-uniform. Okay. The, the, one way to look at what corrects for quantization errors is non-uniform quantizing. And that's what I was trying to emphasize earlier. The non-uniform pushes those lines closer so you don't have the rounding errors. With uniform quantizing, you have a lot more quantization errors. Does that kind of help you out a little bit? Yes, sir. Uh, I was trying to think of how to say it, but I couldn't find words. Yeah. Non-uniform quantizing helps correct for most, what is that word, most quantization errors. You'll get it. And if you guys need help, I am normally on Discord from about 6 o'clock to about 6, 7, sometimes 8, 9 o'clock at night. You can send me a, hey, uh... I need some help with this to include you know during the weekend now the reason I say that is I'm not normally on the RF site but I have a couple of servers that I go to when I'm playing World of Tanks so it will pop up just you might not see it for a couple hours but I will answer you back so, again, if you guys are having problems with this, please, for the love of God, text me. Chat with me. You know, we can go into a room and do a voice chat, or I can pull up some slides or give you a little bit more in-depth on this, okay? Please. I don't want you guys to fail. I want to help you guys. All right. So, next up, we got some.